So all right, we're going to do the crystallography overview for microsystems. So in, in MEMS and microsystems technology, we leverage the crystalline structure of silicon, silicon crystal. That's why we teach about crystallography in this class, because a lot of my technician students either don't remember much from high school or never really were taught much about crystals. And it's important to understand um, so that you can understand how we make different kinds of structures. And that's why we do this, okay? So we, we look a little bit about the science of crystallography, um, how that relates to MEMS. You're going to see three different types of structure, amorphous, polycrystalline, and crystalline. And you'll be able to identify crystal orientation based on something called Miller indices. Miller indices aren't anything to be scared of. It's like uh, knowing which direction you are on a map, right? North, south, east, west, up and down. Miller indices are written a little bit differently, but it's basically just directions. So by the end of this lecture and this unit, you should be able to give an example of an amorphous material, a crystalline material, and a polycrystalline material. You'll be able to understand why it's important when you're making MEMS. And you'll be able to identify the different crystal planes and directions using Miller indice notation. So there will be a quiz on that online. And some of the questions in the handouts that you'll work on today will we'll reinforce that. So by the end of today, you should be pretty good at that. Not that hard. So crystallography, um, some people call it a science of determining the arrangement of atoms in a solid matter. Now you can have um, crystalline proteins. They crystallize proteins to figure out what the structure is. Um, but for the most part, um, we're, we're going to deal with um, crystalline silicon which incidentally has the same structure as diamond, okay? In fact, it's called a diamond structure, right? Diamond, uh, when we refer to diamond, um, it's actually the structure we are referring to. The material is carbon, okay? Um, and if things are not regularly um, aligned, if they don't, don't have long-range order, we can call them amorphous or um, non-crystalline type structures. Okay, and if we have repeating structures, then we call them crystalline. And there's a, there's a little bit of a caveat. There's something called polycrystalline, which is in between the two. Okay, so you can see the picture here. This looks like a very well-defined crystal. And this one looks a little cloudy, right? Mm -hmm. So which one do you think is, is a crystal? Clear one. This clear one, right? It's very precise. This is cloudy. This is probably glass. Okay, and glass is actually amorphous. So they polish this piece of glass to give it the effect of, of being a crystal. So what, what are some examples when I say amorphous? Something is amorphous. What do you think that means? Rocks? Rocks? They have no shape. Okay, that's one thing, no shape. No shape. Can you give me an example of something that's amorphous? Well, okay, a rock. A rock can be crystalline, though, too, right? Yeah. Yeah, but a rock is pretty. Silly putty or something like that. Putty? <laughs> what else? That's amorphous. And clay. Clay? That can be amorphous. What's that? Just about anything. So what is it about amorphous materials that makes them amorphous? It's just a blob. It doesn't have a set structure. Like ah, that's the word. It's very disordered. 
uh, not a set structure. I like that. I don't write very well on this thing. Okay. Not a set structure. Okay, that's good. So those are some things that are amorphous. So is, um, is glass amorphous? Yes. What else is amorphous? A mirror. A mirror is made out of glass. That's good. Plastic. Why did you say that glass is Paper. Paper, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wood. He's asking a good question. Glass reflects light very well. But the actual material in the glass, you cannot see a visible crystal in the glass. If you break if you break glass, if you break a piece of glass, it shatters, right? If you keep breaking it, breaking it, and breaking it, you'll, you'll not get, there's no crystals in glass. There's no defined but order. In the, in the cars, on the screen, if you broke those, you those little pieces, pieces are not crystals, crystals, they're just broken glass. I guess he's asking why does it break in a set way because the shatter the it doesn't, it doesn't. glass doesn't break in a if it's you glass know those windshields that, that will shatter the definition the of glass uh -huh. um, is non it's a non structured material it actually will flow over time so some glass windows are made out of quartz mm -hmm. and quartz is a crystal. But it's not. But those windows are not considered glass. They're considered a uh, crystal. So the ones that break in that little regular little pattern. Um, maybe I think that that is actually designed that way. Okay. I don't think they're crystalline. They're not breaking along crystal plane. Right. Oh, okay, they're just designed so they'll break that way. So while we're on that topic, what about crystals? What are some examples of crystals? Diamond. Diamond. Ruby. Salt. NaCl, right? Quartz crystal. Quartz. Salt. Sand, sand can contain quartz, and quartz is a crystal. So some of the little pieces of sand can be crystals. And you can find crystals sometimes, right? I don't know, is topaz a crystal? Yes. Topaz. Okay, so those are some good in, um, examples of crystalline um, materials. Okay, so here are some other examples, right? We've got glass, we talked about soot. That's not very structured. Plastics, gels. Jello isn't, isn't a crystal, right? It's amorphous. And then ice, sometimes ice will form a crystal, right? Uh, quartz, rock candy, right? Sugar forms crystals. You guys probably made some sugar crystals or some rock candy in one of your science classes. Okay. Okay. Listen up. This is a great picture. Is rock candy just a crystal because it's made of sugar, or is it like the way that it actually kind of grows? The 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 way it. Rock candy forms is you usually put some seed crystals on a string and dip it in a super saturated solution of sugar and water. And the seed crystal allows the, um, the sugar in solution to orient in a specific way. And so those seed crystals grow into a larger crystal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they'll they'll do. Uh, they can use other materials to put, to make different kinds of um, crystals. It doesn't have to be sugar or salt. You can use other types of uh, chemi chemistries. So this um, photo here, okay, 
is a scanning electron microscope picture. Okay, just to give you a sense of scale, these little things here are hinges, like door hinges. And they're about 5 microns, 10 to 5 to 10 microns in size. Okay, this is about 100 microns or so, this plate here. So a human hair would be big, right? It would cover this whole thing. So you see these little hinges, okay? You see this plate and this plate. They're made out of something called polycrystalline silicon, okay? We can deposit polycrystalline silicon um, in, the, in MEMS fabrication systems. This little plate you see here that it's sitting on top of, that's also polycrystalline silicon, all right? And then this big piece underneath, that's the wafer, okay, that you're used to seeing that I handed out last time. That's a single crystal, okay? So you got polycrystalline materials and single crystal, monocrystalline, okay? So um, we, use, we use the different types of crystal structures to make our MEMS devices. Um, we don't have to use crystalline materials, but for some applications, it's a good Okay, and we already mentioned we're going to talk about amorphous polycrystalline and crystalline materials. We're going to talk about the Miller index, and the Miller indices are our way of finding your way inside of a crystal. It, it, it's a road map, and you're going to be able to identify the different planes and the different directions in the crystal, and we'll talk a little bit about how crystalline silicon, okay, and we've got some videos we'll show too. Okay, so we already mentioned that this is a cartoon, okay, of a cantilever, and we're going to learn about cantilevers in a few weeks, where we etched out underneath it, and these cantilevers are generally made out of polycrystalline silicon, and it's sitting, this blue thing is part of a, of a silicon wafer, and that would be pure silicon crystal, monocrystalline. All right, so here we have some cartoons, right? This is a sketch of what different materials would look like. So on the left, we have one set of arrangements of atoms, and on the right, we have another set of arrangement of atoms. The one on the right is what? Amorphous or crystal? Crystal. Yeah. Why do you say that? It's very, very structured. And here on the left would be amorphous. Okay? It's not structured. So if I'm sitting on this, this atom right here, okay, and, and I was going to tell you where the next atom was, I wouldn't be able to tell you that because there's very little structure here. I definitely couldn't tell you where the tenth atom away from me is, right? But if I'm sitting on this one here, I can predict where the tenth atom is, right? Because I just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'd say, oh, it's going to be right there. Because this is very ordered. So it's very predictable. So do you think the material properties on the left type of material is going to be the same on the right? So let's pretend this is carbon. And this is carbon, all carbon atoms. You got amorphous carbon on the left and crystalline carbon on the right. What would you want? The right. Why would you want the right one? Predictable. It's valuable. Yeah. Right? What's, what's uh, crystalline carbon? You like to have that on your rings and your ears, right? It's diamond. Diamond's worth a lot. If I said I'm going to trade your diamond... Give me your diamond, and I'll give you the same amount of pencil lead. Because that's graphite, that's carbon. Is that a fair trade? So the structure is important, right? So how you put things together is important. It, it provides value. Okay? So we can make this stuff in a lab, too, by the way, very easily. They can grow two, three, four, five-carat diamonds 
for a few thousand bucks in a lab. How much does a carat, one carat diamond or four carat diamond cost? Does anybody know? I don't know. I don't I buy think diamonds. One carat is at least around, I think around 10, I don't know. Depends on the Couple, quality. Five to 10,000? Right. Depending on, on clarity, color, mm -hmm. cut, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. So $10,000 for, for a diamond you dig out of the ground and a couple of thousand if you make it in the lab. Okay. All right, so in order to describe directions and describe structure, there's something we call a unit cell. Okay, so here we have a very organized set of atoms in a unit cell. This one happens to look like a cube. Okay, this is one type of structure. And all of these distances are fixed and well-defined because it's a crystal, all right? And the unit cell is the smallest cell you can make that's still organized. So if we make it any smaller than this, then we lose information about the structure. Now, we can take unit cells and add them together and build a lattice, a crystal lattice, which is a big crystal, right? So that's what you see here. This is a representation of a lattice. So you can see here's a unit cell, here's a unit cell, right? And there's more here. Can you kind of visualize that? Mm -hmm. See if I can uh, make this bigger somehow. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can see those unit cells in there, right? Right here. Okay, good. So, I have a question for you. How many atoms are there in this unit cell? Everybody agree? Two. I hear a two. How many atoms? Yeah, in the unit cell. Sure it's two? Why is it one? One. He's right. Because these atoms are shared with unit cells around it. Oh. So if yeah, it, that's the tricky part, right? If you say, okay, I've got another unit cell here. Um, let me see. I'm try to make this bigger. All right? Another face of the unit cell is right here. And then it continues this way. Can you guys see that? So now, this atom here, there's part of it in this unit cell. But then you have another unit cell, right, above it. Okay? So there's another unit cell on top of this thing. So this atom is also shared with this one. And it's shared with this one. And it's shared with the one in front. Okay? So how many unit cells are attached to this one? Four? Eight? How many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, there's eight. Can you see that? It's kind of hard to see. But this one atom... It's shared with eight other unit cells. So is this one, so is this one, so is this one, so is this one. And here you can kind of see it, right? This is the part of the atom inside the unit cell. It's about an eighth. Okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Each one is one eighth. Eight divided by eight is one. One. Right? One. Okay, so let's imagine there's an atom in the middle of that unit cell. Then how many um, atoms are there per unit cell? Two, because this one in the middle is only in one unit cell. 
Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. But, you know, you'll, you'll have questions like that on the quiz. How many atoms are in the unit cell? And there'll be a picture. There's a, an example of a face cubic or a face centered cubic. So that one would have um, atoms on each face, right? You know, I should bring sugar cubes, and you should stack them around the corner, and then it, you'd see it right away. Did, yeah, if we can find some cubes floating around in here, we can. It, it's obvious. It's kind of hard to see if you're just trying to analyze the corner. But if you um, can, you picture four sugar cubes on the table. Can you get that in your head? Mm -hmm. Where the four sugar cubes intersect, let me draw it. And also four on top of those. So we've got four, we're getting there. So we've got four sugar cubes. So now imagine you're looking at the atom on top at that intersection. Right, there's one atom mm -hmm. at that intersection. And now you're going to have... Let me draw this thinner. Now you're going to put four sugar cubes on top, right? Well, you put four sugar cubes on the table. Then you look at the atom, which is the red dot. That's at the intersection of the four cubes. Then you have four cubes on top, right? So that atom's actually shared with eight cubes. Not yet. This is the, just the one with the, with the corners. Okay, so that one red um, atom up there is shared with four or with eight cubes. So that means one eighth of the atom occupies each cube, each unit cell. Okay? Because you've got to keep track, you've got to do the accounting right. It's just a mathematical construct. Okay? And then if you have um, atoms on the, on, the, on the surfaces of each one, that means half is shared with the one above it. Okay, so if I have one on the surface in the center of the unit cell, then that one's shared with the one above it. So half of this, half of this is below and the other half is above. So you have to count halves. Okay, now right, let's move on. So if we have a unit cell, right, and it can be multiple different structures. We picked the, the easy one, the cube. But you could have face center cubic, you could have diamond, which is um, tetragonal uh, type of structure. If you do that and say, okay, my unit cell is represented by this funky shape. It looks like, I don't know, some kind of cereal piece. If you represent the uh, unit cell with a structure, and then you put that unit cell in a, in a specific pattern, you can build a crystal. This is called a lattice. A lattice defines where the unit cells are, and the unit cell defines the structure of the crystal. Okay? So you put the unit cell on top of a lattice, and you get a crystal. We're not going to go into that much detail on, on that part of the construct, okay? That's just some terminology. Now, these are really cool. We have some basic structures here. We already looked at the one on the left. This is simple cubic. We just have an atom on every corner. Then we have body-centered cubic. So that means we have an atom in the middle. And that's colored red so you can see it. Um, they can all be the same type of atom. And then you have face center cubic. So these red ones are now on the faces. So how many, um, how many atoms are in this first one? One. Okay, good. One. Oops. One. Okay, how many in the second one? 
Good. You guys are getting it. Does everybody see that? And then this one's a little trickier, right? Well, we already established that the, the blue ones, there's one, right? And this one is shared with the one above it and the one below it. So how much of it is in the one half? And how many halves are there? There's six sides, six halves, plus one. Four. Yes. You got the three halves, or you've got the six halves, from one from each side. There's six sides. Okay? You guys see that? So there's half a red one for each side. There's six sides. That makes three total. Okay? And then you have to add the one for the corners, which is one-eighth for each one. Okay? So that's just... Uh, some basic stuff. How did, you, how did you get two for blood because the red is completely inside of the unit yeah, cell. Yeah, so that's yeah, one. Yeah. And the corners are one eighth. Each corner is one eighth. Okay? Are ready? Those are the answers, right? So we have two in this one, four in this one. One atom for the corners, and then we have uh, one half times six is three, plus the one for the corners is four. Okay? Now here's a carbon unit cell. And we, we colored them different colors so you could see what's going on, right? And we're trying to show how the bonds are. So if we zoom in on this, maybe, there we go. You can see the different bonds. Okay, this one green carbon atom here is bonded to four others. One, two, three, four. Okay, now how many of you remember a little chemistry? Okay, carbon has four valence electrons. Do you remember that? It's really good for biology because it, it likes to bond with a lot of different things, right? CO2, right? Carbon dioxide, that's, that's a very important molecule, very simple. Okay, so carbon likes to bond with, you know, use, using all of its four valence electrons. So if you put a bunch of carbon together, remember, these are all carbon. They're just colored different so you can see them put a bunch of carbons together, they're going to want to bond four ways for the most part. There's some carbon double bond things like in some of the polymers and stuff like that. But, you know, it's going to try to bond generally in this structure. If it's very, very repeatable and very set, then you have a crystal. But you can get amorphous carbon where most of the carbons are hooked up with four other carbons around it. But those bond angles are, are flexing a little bit. They're not as stable. And that would make it an amorphous structure. Okay? So that shows you the, um, the bonding. And they call that tetragonal bonding. That means that one carbon atom has four other bonds. Kind of like a, a twisted pyramid, if you think about it. All right, so we already talked about this one, which was what? What kind of structure? Crystalline. Cr crystalline. And this one? So what do you think this is? What does poly mean? More than two. Many, right? Many sides. Polygon. Stop sign's a polygon. A triangle is a polygon. Right? Things with more, with many... Uh, with many sides, right, in that case. But this is polycrystalline. So we have, right here is a crystal, right? This is very structured. Here's another crystal with slightly different orientation. It's rotated. Here's another one. Of course, in reality, these uh, little crystals are made up of 
maybe millions or billions of atoms, okay? Because remember, atoms are about what? Two to three angstroms apart. So you can have a lot of crystals put together, and each little crystal can have millions or billions of atoms in there. Okay, so this is polycrystalline. So you know, there's a there's a actually a test question where you see these pictures and they say which one's polycrystalline, which one's amorphous, and which one is crystalline. Okay, so that should be easy now. Right? You have a question? Okay. All right, so there are the answers right here. So when solids and when when a solid's atoms are arranged randomly and it's non-predictable, that means it's um, it's an amorphous material like styrofoam, window glass. It's probably amorphous, right? Is salt amorphous? No. no. Uh, what else is in here? Okay, so this, this is a, a cartoon of, of what an amorphous material might look like, okay? What's this? Peanut brittle. Peanut brittle. That's not structured, right? Mm -hmm. That's actually a mixture, too, because not only do you have the, I don't know what you call it, the sugary part, but you have nuts thrown in there, too, so <laughs> it, you know it's not a crystal. So it's a mess. It's an amorphous um, material. And if you break peanut brittle, it doesn't break in nice, organized ways, right? If you break a diamond, it's going to break a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. That's how they cleave them. That's how they get the facets. In the old days, they did that, right? The big diamonds were given to the best jeweler to cut because they don't want to screw up. So he'd study it for months. Then he'd knock off a face, make it nice and flat on one side, and then rotate it, knock off a face. But you didn't want to make a big diamond into a tiny diamond. Mm -mm. You wanted to try to get as many facets as you can and make it look pretty and keep it big, right? Because that's the value. Okay, so amorphous solids have the following characteristics. There's no long-range order, okay? Um, there's no long-range order in amorphous solids, so you can't predict where the hundredth atom is going to be because it's not organized, okay? No long-range order. Uh, you can't really cleave it, right? When we cut a diamond, when we whack a diamond and it cleaves right along a certain crystal plane to give you that beautiful facet, you can't do that with an amorphous material. You try to do that and it, it falls apart. It's brittle. Okay, it shatters. It doesn't cleave. Okay. Amorphous uh, silicon has different electrical properties than crystalline silicon. It has different mechanical properties as well. Now here's a close-up. Remember that thing from Sandia that we showed? The, the little flip mirror? Right, the thing that looked like this, and it had the hinges. It was. I said it was made out of polycrystalline silicon, right? Well, when you um, magnify it, so you can see it at maybe five microns. You know, this is five microns across. If you magnify it, you can see little crystals. So here's a crystal. Here's a crystal, here's a little crystal, here's a crystal, here's a little bigger crystal. So there's lots of crystals. Each crystal is pure silicon. So, oh no, this one's diamond. Okay, so this is actually carbon. But polycrystalline silicon looks the same. Okay, so this is uh, actually diamond, but it's, it's, a, it's a polycrystalline diamond that was deposited onto a, to a wafer by um, Dr. Dean Oslam at uh, Michigan State University. So he's coding things with diamond. Okay, pretty cool stuff. So what do you think that would be good for if I coated something with crystalline diamond? Something that has to be very hard. It'd be very hard. Optical properties are different, right? High index of refraction, that's what gives it the color. It allows you to spread the light out better. 
Okay, there's an optical property called index of refraction. So they usually do these type of things, these, these carbon um, diamond coatings, because they withstand a lot of different chemicals. So you coat something with crystalline diamond, and then chemicals won't eat through it. It's very, very strong, very, very um, protected. Okay? And metals can also look like this under a scanning electron microscope. Metals can be crystalline. So we, we had issues when we were making um, computer chips. Uh, we were very interested in, in the average grain size because at these boundaries, the electrical properties get messed up. So if you imagine this is now a metal, and you're trying to put current through here, okay? So you put a positive voltage on this side, and a negative voltage on this. The electrons are going to go this way, right? Through the metal. But every time they see a boundary, they kind of bounce around. So if you have lots of grains, your resistance might be different than if you only have a few grains. So the electrical properties will change because the, the little crystals are, are changing. Okay. So here's another example of polycrystalline material. If I zoom in on this, you can see um, all the different crystals. And I've got some real crystals we'll pass around in a few minutes. So you can see that, okay? And like I said, these grain boundaries is what messes up the electrical flow. So if you have more or less of them, the electrical flow will be different. Also, they'll break different, and they'll have some different optical properties depending on how big the grains are, okay? So they do have long-range order inside the little tiny crystals. Remember, one little crystal could be millions or billions of atoms. So if I'm inside of one of those tiny crystals and I'm looking around, it's going to look organized, right? And I can take a thousand steps in one direction and, and the atoms are perfectly lined up. Now, I might eventually get to a grain boundary, a million or so atoms away, and then all of a sudden everything shifts. Right? It's like if you tile a floor, and then all of a sudden the tiles shift in their orientation. That's the kind of idea I'm trying to get you to visualize. Okay? So there is long-range order inside the tiny crystals. Okay, crystals are defined by a regular well-ordered lattice. The lattice consists of stack planes of atoms. Okay, because molecules of a crystal fit together, like in sodium chloride, and contain strong electrical attractions between the atoms, the crystal is pretty strong. It's hard to break them. So here's diamond. Here's a diamond structure. So if these are all carbon, then we would call it a diamond that you wear on your finger. Okay? Um, if it's all silicon, then it's, it's, it's uh, silicon with a, in a diamond structure. Did you know that um, the guys who were making the, the diamonds in the lab somewhere in New Jersey um, started selling them? They called them diamonds, right? And they said, you know, these are, these are perfect diamonds made in a lab. And there's a, there's a what's the cartel's group name? De Beers. De Beers. De Beers wanted to sue them. They said they're not real diamonds, you have to call them synthetic diamonds, and took them to court. They wanted them to label them as synthetic diamond. But De Beers lost the court case, because diamond, if you ask any material scientist what diamond is, it's a specific structure. Okay? So they lost the court case. So when someone says, I have a diamond for you, it could be made out of silicon. Because <laughs> it's the structure that, that defines the term diamond, all right? Something to remember. And diamonds aren't really worth as much as they claim, right? They have warehouses full of them. It's 
why you always see all those diamond commercials constantly. They're trying to sell you diamonds at a higher price than they're actually worth. Be careful. So if they let all the diamonds out on the market that they have in those warehouses, they wouldn't be worth more than a few dollars each, right? Yeah, they, found, they find lots of them in Africa, but now you can make them too. So, All right, crystals. Extremely long-range order, right? So if I have a crystal that's one centimeter by one centimeter, how many atoms are in that? Any idea? One centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. How many atoms are in that? If the spacing is about two angstroms. Let's even make it one angstrom. It's easier to, to do the math, right? So if you have one angstrom between each atom, how many atoms are in one centimeter? You got, you got uh, centimeter would be what? One times 10 to the eighth? One times 10 to the eighth? Right, one centimeter is 10 to the minus two. And angstrom's 10 to the minus 10, so you got 10 to the 10 to the eighth per side, right? So there's 10 to the eighth, 10 to the eighth, 10 to the eighth. And you cube that, so it's 10 to the 24th. That's how many atoms are approximately in one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. So what, what number is that? That's how big it is. That's how many atoms are in a cubic centimeter, give or take a billion, <laughs> right? Or a couple hundred billion. It doesn't really matter. There's a lot, OK? So imagine organizing anything so well, OK, that everything is in the exact same space, place that it's supposed to be, that many of them. So one by one by one crystal has that many atoms in it. That's a huge number. How many stars are there in the universe? Does anybody know? It's probably something like that. Right? We did, is that a yada? Right? We, we did all those weird 10 to the 24th. What was that? A yada or a zeta or a zepto? It's some big, big number. Okay. So that gives you an idea. There are a lot of atoms in, in a very small crystal. All right, so if we take, what, what, what causes it to be in this structure? Well, it goes all the way down to the atom. Right, we already talked about it. Carbon has four valence electrons, as does silicon. Carbon and silicon are on top of each other in the periodic table. So if you put carbon together, it's going to form into a crystal. And the shape of the crystal and the structure of the crystal is defined by these valences. Okay? So we put them all together, and they try to organize in a nice, organized manner those crystals. Okay? Now, when they organize, you can look at these things from different um, views, and you'll get different structures. It'll look different. So if I look at it from one side, okay, look at it um, down this direction, I'll see four atoms on the face, right? And that's what we're seeing here. If I look at it from an angle, if I look at this plane here, this green plane, it's going to look like this. This looks really weird. So now we need to define, how do I look at a crystal, right? It's important. The direction's important tells you what, what the thing's going to look like. So here we have two different views of, of that unit cell and several cells behind it. So in one direction, it's very organized. If I hit this, if I whack it with a hammer, how's it going to break? It's going to be like this, right? If I whack this one, it's going to be in some weird, you know, weird, weird bonding thing, uh, weird angles. 
Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll find one and show you guys in a little bit. So crystal planes um, are important when we're making things. And we have to understand how to view crystal planes and how to describe what direction. And that's where the Miller indices come in. Okay, So don't freak out about the Miller indices. They're, um, they're a way of finding out the direction. So how many of you have heard of Cartesian coordinates? Cartesian? Well, coordinate system, like X, Y, Z? Yeah. Okay. That's called Cartesian coordinate system. Oh, I know that. Okay. So you probably heard of that. You might not remember the name, right? Cartesian. There's spherical coordinate systems, and there's some really esoteric ones. I'm sure our mathematicians can show you ten different ways of doing coordinate systems. But the, the main one we usually use is X, Y, and Z. Okay. So when we're talking about Miller indices, X, Y, and Z are represented by numbers, okay, and a place. So you can, you, what, what do I mean by that? If I have a 1, 0, 0, that's the X direction, okay, and if I have... Zero, one, zero. That's why. Yeah, you're catching on, Gina. Okay, so what do you think Z is? Uh, zero, zero, one. You guys are good, right? Zero, zero, one. That's this way. Okay, now here comes a trick question. Okay, let me change the color here. Uh, what color do you like? Pink. Pink's a good color. All right, so what about if I ha have something that's one one zero. Any ideas? It's X and Y. Good. So you go one unit in X and one unit in Y. And then you connect where you started to where you ended. And it's this direction. Okay. And we're going to do this in 3D. We've got tape and sticks and stuff. All right. So it's, it's not that hard. So you can define all kinds of directions. I mean, you could put a 2, 4, 7 in there. So you take two steps in X, right? 2, 4, 7. So you take 2 in X, 4 in Y, and 7 in Z, and then you connect the dots, and you can have any direction you want, right? Any weird direction, just by combining the numbers. So crystallographers use these numbers to tell you what direction you're looking at, right? In an airplane, you say 6 o'clock, 12 o'clock. 6 o'clock's behind you. 12 o'clock's in front of you. 6 o'clock, or 12 o'clock high is look up in front of you. Right? I don't know what the Marines do to give direction. There's two ways to do it. You can, um, you can write your direction like this or with square brackets. Okay, and you write your planes with rounded brackets or braces. Okay, there's two ways to do each one. And I think, and this is Matt's theory, I think the reason they have those two different methods is because they had different types of typewriters back in the old days. So some had parentheses, some had braces on them. Okay? So when you see the parentheses, the round stuff, or the curly Q ones, right, the braces, those are going to be planes. It's important to remember that because your test has examples of that on there. If they've got the square or the pointy ones, the chevrons, um, then they're vectors. So just, just think of, you know, if the corners are, are pointy, then they're directions. And if they're rounded, they're planes. Okay? So a 1, 0, 0 plane is perpendicular to the 1, 0, 0 direction. Okay? Okay. So there's the 1, 0, 0 plane right here. What about this one in the back? 
It's the same. You're good. So the one in the back is also one zero zero. Okay, it's the orientation that matters. It's not the placement of it. Because the, the um, remember the crystals, there's lots of atoms, so it doesn't really matter where the origin is. It only matters what the direction is. So if it's a, a, a V, which is the top one, mm -hmm. so the bottom one would be the same thing? Yeah, the bottom one would also be the same. And how would you write that while we're on that? It wouldn't be 100. Zero, zero. Because zero, 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 zero. Z is the third one, the third place. So you go zero steps in X, zero in Y, and one in Z, and that's this direction, right? So that would be 0, zero 001, pointy. And then the plane perpendicular to that, right? is the zero, zero, 001 plane. Not too hard, right? And we'll do more practice. Okay, here's a tough one. See this plane right here, this yellow one? It's not 100, zero, zero, is it? No. So what do you think it is? Come on, speak up. What do you think it is, Carlos? One, one, zero. Any other ideas? Why, why do you say it's one, one, zero? How did you determine that? Okay, so this plane, if I extend it, right? The plane goes on forever, right? Planes go on forever. We just colored the side so you can see it better. So this plane's going on forever. And remember what we said? The plane is perpendicular to the direction. So the direction, I'm going to make it blue. The direction is this one. OK? And, or you could also draw it here, because it's crystal, so it keeps repeating, right? So this blue line is perpendicular to this green line here, OK? So that means this plane is perpendicular to the blue line, OK? And you could even draw it, maybe, comes out of the plane, right? So this is this one, yeah, let's draw it thicker. coming out of the plane. And then the other one's behind the plane, right? This guy, it's behind the plane. So that's perpendicular to that yellow plane. All right, good job. Now comes the harder one. What about this? Carlos already knows the answer. One, one, one. Do you guys see it? How do you get one, one, one? Let them try. How do you get one, one, one? That's the right answer. Any ideas? You're not seeing it. That's OK. We're going to do it physically. You take one step in x, one step in y, one step in z. You end up over here, OK, right here. You started here, OK? And then what do you do? You connect the dots. Okay, so that vector I just drew, that direction, is perpendicular. There's a hole here. It's coming through the, that plane. Okay? It's kind of hard to see. Okay, so there are the answers. Okay, so think about it. Learn how to sketch these. That's part of your assignment today. Going to do hopefully in class. Yeah, we should have time. Get one assignment done in class. Okay, so why is it important? Again, electrical properties depend on the structure, mechanical properties depend on the structure. This bulk modulus thing is how flexible something is, okay? And it might be flexible in one direction differently than in another direction. 
okay, because the crystal structure is different depending which way you're looking at it. Of course, the optical properties are also different. You see that with your um, diamond, right? Carbon, carbon in a diamond structure is clear, and it bends light really, really well. That's why you see all the different colors, right? When you look at a diamond, you girls ever see that? Look closely at a diamond. You're, you'll see different colors, right? Because it bends the light a lot. Even if you put it in the sun, you see Yeah, if it's sunny, you'll, you'll see a rainbow on the ceiling, right? Or against the uh, building if you, if you can get the sunlight to go through it. It bends the light a lot. It has a high index of refraction. That's another reason people like diamonds. It's great for optics, right? It bends light really well. So, but if you take silicon and make it into a diamond structure, it looks like a shiny mirror. Remember when I passed around the silicon wafer the last time? I've got some more. It doesn't look anything like diamond, like, like the clear diamond of the carbon, even though the structure is exactly the same. Okay, so here's silicon. We can etch really cool structures. Okay, we can make things. So this side here is one of these sides. So we can make things. We can make a hole in the back of the crystalline wafer and to a membrane that we put on the front side, and we can make a flexible pressure sensor. Pretty cool. We can make V-grooves, okay? So we can make things that are like V-shaped. That might be useful if you're making microfluidic channels. You can also make shapes um, that come out of the surface like this. If you take these two and put them together, they'll meet. They'll, they'll fit really, really well. So you can make things tongue and groove type things. Uh, cantilevers and bridges, uh, mesas and pyramids, cavities and holes, and really pointy things uh, for making probes. So those of, of things we can make uh, using the crystalline structural properties and the shapes. Okay, now how do we see what orientation we're at? You can't really see it. I mean, if you're a jeweler, you can look at the crystal diamond from different angles and probably figure out what orientation you're looking at because the light will refract differently at different angles. But crystal and silicon looks just like silver, like shiny metal. So you can't tell by looking at it. So this is, a, this is an x-ray diffraction pattern. So you shoot a beam of x-rays through there. And the x-rays will form a pattern on film that's different depending on what angle you're looking at it. So how many of you have heard about DNA? And it has a structure. What's the structure called? Double helix, and who, who discovered that? It wasn't Watson and Crick. It was the, the woman, right, that did all the work. What was her name? Rosalind. Yeah, it was Rosalind? Franklin. Franklin. That sounds right. So Rosalind Franklin discovered the shape of the double helix by sending x-rays through crystallized DNA and looking at the pattern, and she figured it out. So if we do it through, um, if, we, if we send an x-ray beam through crystalline silicon, it'll make a pattern. And if we rotate that crystalline silicon, it'll make a different pattern. So we'll be able to figure out what direction we're looking at. This one looks like it's, we're looking at the one zero zero. Yeah. Okay, so I don't, I'm not sure which is which. This one is probably the 111. You can see the pattern is kind of star-shaped. And you'll, you'll understand that when we break some wafers, which will probably be next time. This has a different pattern, and this has yet another pattern. Okay, so this one is more of a right angles. This one has a, a strange pattern to it. And then this one is more like pizza slices. It's, it's hard. It's, it's hard to see that. But 
The main point is, is if you look at something through, with x-rays, you can tell what the atomic structure is. Okay? So how do you make it? Well, we melt a bunch of pure silicon, and we put a seed crystal on the end of a rod and dip it in the, in the molten silicon and then slowly pull it out, and we create what's called an ingot or a boule. So those are two terms we use, ingot or boule. Okay, and we slowly pull it out, it takes about a day, and then we get a nice huge crystal. That, What's the, diameter the diameter depends on how big a wafer you want. So that's what the diameter of the crystal is, wafer Yeah, if you pull it out slower, you'll get a bigger diameter. Diameter. What's the, seed the seed crystal is one little piece of pure crystal and silicon that they put on the end, and they have to figure out what direction it's at. So that's where they use the x-ray diffraction. So they use the x-ray pattern and they figure out what, what orientation to put that seed crystal on the end of the rod. And then it's like the seed crystal when you grow rock candy. You gotta put something on the string, right? And you use little sugar crystals, those are seed crystals. And then the other stuff can grow on that. It has an orientation to it. And we'll show a video a little bit. Okay, so here's a close-up. You know, your seed crystal is right on the end. You just dip it right to the surface and slowly pull it out. The rod will rotate in one direction, and they actually rotate the bucket. They call it a crucible in the opposite direction. And it's pretty slow. Okay, very, very controlled. If you do it too fast, you'll get dislocations. And you won't have a constant crystal structure. It will be a shift, right, like those polycrystalline. So it actually looks like this. Okay, this is a real bool. Right? This is crystalline silicon. And you can tell, see these facets here? I can tell if when they cut this and polish it, this is going to be a 1-1-1 one, 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 uh, wafer. The surface of the wafer is 1-1-1. One, one, one. Okay, and we'll, we'll work with that some more in a little bit. Okay? So you slice it, polish it, and you get those nice handed out. So, you know, when we talk about diamonds, the, the ones that are the girl's best friend, right? Um, why, why is the quality determined by the crystal structure? Why is that important? The more structure it is, the more valuable. Stronger it is, and the more it reflects the light. Yeah, the, the, the proper optical properties are, are better. The value comes from its rarity, or assumed rarity. Okay. Also, it's hard. But right. also how hard it is to make it. Mm-hmm. So we use polycrystalline and crystalline materials as substrates for microsystems and devices because that's the way the electronics industry grew up. Okay? So all the equipment is based on making computer chips. So we can make MEMS using the same equipment. And we also found that, gee, we have to send electrical signals through the MEMS devices as well to make them move, turn them into... Um, um, sensors and that sort of thing. Okay, so that's why we leverage polycrystalline and crystalline versions of silicon. Okay. So solid matter is either amorphous polycrystalline or crystalline. Silicon polycrystalline wafers are widely used as a substrate. Actually, this should say monocrystalline, so this is a typo. Mono crystalline. I've got to tell MJ to fix that. So monocrystalline, um, this one right here, monocrystalline wafers. So the wafers are single crystal. 
Okay, and, they, and the wafers have a specific type of electrical and mechanical properties. And we can change the electrical properties by putting in a little bit of a dopant. Add some more electrons to the lattice, and then we can make it electrically um, conductive. Excuse me, could you explain dopant? Yeah, you throw... Um, so remember that, that silicon has four valence electrons. If I put something in there, like arsenic or boron... They're on either side of the um, silicon on the periodic table. So one has four val or five valence electrons and one only has three. Okay, so if you want to add electrons, you put the type of um, atom in there that has an, elect uh, an extra electron in its val valence shell. That electron won't be able to bond with anything because they'll only bond with the four neighbors. So that fifth electron is free to move around in the crystal structure. So that crystal now becomes n-type. It, it has free negative charged things in there that can move. So it's n-type. Well, we found out that the n is the electrons. Now let's say we want to make it more on the positive side, make it p-type. Then we put in a, an atom that only has three electrons. Okay, So now you've got this hole. <laughs> You're missing an electron. So um, so that the, the, the free electrons will move, actually the, the electrons from the other shells will move into the hole and then the hole moves around and that makes it p-type. Okay, so it depends on what doping you put in. And you don't need a lot. You maybe need 10 to the 16th uh, arsenic atoms in a cubic centimeter to make it uh, electrically conductive. Right, and remember how many there are. 10 to the 23rd or 24th in a cubic centimeter. So that's one in 100,000 is arsenic or boron. So that's a real small amount, right, compared to the rest of the crystal. So the crystal basically keeps its mechanical structure and its optical structure. It just changes a little bit on its electrical properties, and you can make it very conductive by just adding a little bit of dopants in there. Okay, that's it. Any questions? Okay, you guys want a break? Yeah. You need to stretch your legs and wake up, and then we'll do some hands-on stuff. All right.